So instead of telling doctors how good vitamin E was for certain indications, we had to develop new and possibly dangerous drugs to treat the same condition. It's crazy. It used to be also that colleges, universities, and so forth also did a lot of research. Evidently, they're not doing that research, or they're only doing research that they will recover money from. Yes. So they're not doing the basic research that uh, used to be happening. Well, and actually, drug companies used to do a lot of basic research. When I worked for the Upjohn Company, I started out in a department that did more or less basic research. Now, granted, it was on, on compounds that company was especially interested in and hoped one day they might be able to make drugs, but that was very far down the road. So what's happened with all these regulations, the drug companies can no longer afford to do any kind of research at all. They simply develop drugs. And either the universities or, you know, the private sector have to do this research and then they find something, but they can't develop it because it's so expensive. So then they go and hand it off to the drug companies, which have basically become development companies. It, it's kind of crazy because it's so much wasted money. I mean, like the universities used to like mm -hmm. uh, test vitamin E. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, you give it at a certain dosage, uh, it helps to prevent this or, right, or right. that. And, and yet, they're not doing that anymore. Well, that's right. And that's because of a change in the law that happened in the 1980s that allowed universities to actually patent their research. Yes. Now, before 1962, and even when I was employed at the Upjohn Company in the mid-70s, we were still developing some compounds without patents because these regulations were just kind of starting to ramp up. But now, uh, you know, it's impossible to develop a drug without a patent. Well, what was happening is all of a sudden, there were no new drugs coming out. And one of the things they did is they extended the patent life for certain drugs by law, and they let universities patent things. So now, all the university research is targeted to developing these patents so that they can sell them to the pharmaceutical firms, and that's why the basic research isn't happening. So the things that we could do that are preventive that are low cost. Yes, low cost. Uh, aren't, uh, that research isn't being done. That's and, correct. And, and therefore isn't being uh, was it, uh, passed on to us so that we could benefit from that. That's right, and if anyone attempts to do that research in a university or private setting, I mean, it becomes their funds are limited. The research doesn't meet usually the standards that the FDA has set, and so the FDA says, oh, we don't believe in this, it's bogus, whatever, because it doesn't meet our standards. Well, the standards are very high. So what happens is that discourages people from even trying to raise money to do these studies. It's, it's a very tough situation. And most of this came about, and you mentioning 1962, because I think that's when the the lumide, the lumide, yes, the, yes. The lumide. Yes, 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 I know, it's hard, tongue twister. <laughs> yeah, but you, of course, you're in drug research and you've heard of that before. Yes. But, I mean, that was what uh, they had developed mm -hmm. for women who were pregnant that they could take for morning sickness. Now, I know they have discovered, like, it's, uh, it does have uses with the leprosy. That's correct. Well, actually, it wasn't developed for women with morning sickness. It was developed. Most people don't know this, it was developed as a sleeping pill to replace barbiturates, which of course you take an overdose and you die. Yes. So it was a safer, safer sleeping drug. And what happened is the drug company received reports from women who took their husband's prescription that, hey, you know, this stuff works for morning sickness. And so they were enthused about selling for that as well. But what ended up happening is, you know, our state of the art wasn't very good then. We didn't know the fetus was quite so sensitive to something that the mother might not be. So these babies, mostly in Europe, were born, you know, missing limbs, which is, of course, very uh, tragic. Well, but what happened was is that uh, the FDA uh, had not approved the drug for this country. That's right, because they thought there was a kidney problem, <laughs> which actually wasn't the problem. Yeah, it was the right, the right thing for the wrong reason kind of thing, which is fine, better that than the opposite. But they started touting themselves as being this wonderful agency That's right. that prevented all of these horrible deformities that were found in European children. Now, the European Medical uh, Society, my gathering is, they took from this episode was, is that you try not to prescribe anything for pregnant women. Yes, that's exactly right. And what most people don't know is we've had an American thalidomide here and nobody knows about it because nobody's been talking about it. So let me share it with your listeners. It's very important. And again, shows how this um, regulation backfires. You know, these 62 regulations were passed for benthylidomide. 
But as I mentioned before, they, they prevent prevention. And we knew back in the 1980s, for example, that a B vitamin called folic acid would prevent spina bifida and other severe birth defects. And these are severe birth defects. You usually have to institutionalize the children. At least the thalidomide children were normal other than the fact they were missing a limb. So what happened was when folic acid manufacturers realized this, they wanted to tell doctors about it. But the FDA told them if they told doctors about it, they'd shut them down because they hadn't gone through this rigorous regulatory process. And then the Center for Disease Control said, well, we're going to tell them so they started, another government agency, right, started telling women about it. And the FDA told the folic acid manufacturers, if you even talk about how the CDC is recommending this, we'll shut you down, because you haven't gone through all these regulations. And of course, they were just trying to be consistent, but you can see the craziness here. Well, then the FDA finally said, gee, well, women need to take folic acid. We will demand that all cereal manufacturers put folic acid in their cereal. So that's what they did. Well, what happens if you don't eat cereal? Well, that's it. So women were not getting the right dose. And the number of infants that were probably affected by this are huge. I think I estimated something like 25,000 children were either aborted or put in, well, actually, I don't even think I counted the abortion. I think I just counted the deformities. Were born deformed. And if you think about the thalidomide tragedy, that was a big tragedy. That was 10,000 children. So the FDA, by forbidding folic man acid manufacturers from talking about this and educating the American public, because women have to take it before they even know they're pregnant, because it's in the first few weeks of pregnancy. So, so by saying this, the FDA actually caused an American thalidomide, but nobody knows about it. Nobody knows about this tragedy. They don't realize that it could have been prevented. And they don't know about it because the media is licensed. Mm -hmm. uh, TV station can have their license pulled uh, under FDR. Conservative talk ra radio stations disappeared because they told them that if they talked uh, conservative talk on a radio show, they would pull the license. Mm -hmm. One of them did, they pulled the license, and suddenly we had liberal talk show stations. And, and to say that it's a new phenomenon is, is ridiculous, since under Reagan, Reagan finally put people on the FCC that finally allowed conservative talk radio shows. Mm, I wasn't aware of that. So it's not a new phenomenon. It would have been there all the time, except liberals don't believe in freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. They believe that they have the right to say things, but nobody else does. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, you know, we're, li we're libertarian. Yes, yes. Libertarians believe in one thing, liberty. Yeah. I talk to people, and, and you know, they like liberty. They think it's a great idea. They have no idea what it is. Mm -hmm. They want it for themselves, but they won't give it to anybody. Mm -hmm. Well, see, that's the thing. We're, we're afraid to give other people freedom because we think they're going to do something horrible to us. And yet, we want it for ourselves. And of course, the solution is if somebody, if somebody actually does harm you. For example, we're talking about a pharmaceutical companies. Let's say a pharmaceutical company says, oh, we've tested this and it's perfectly safe. And you, know, you take it, and of course, it's, they've never tested it. It's not safe. You get sick. What do you do? Well, in a libertarian society, what would happen is you could sue them for fraud. You know, they lied to you, and you took that drug and got sick, and you could get full compensation, you know, to make, make sure that everything was done that could be done to take care of you. Well, you know, that's so damaging to a company to have to do that, that they're going to avoid that situation if at all possible. In fact, in, in the years that preceded the FDA enforcement, Companies were very careful to protect their brand name. They would advertise, our, our serums have never caused this type of a death, you know, or something like that. I mean, they, they were very careful to protect their brand name and advertise their quality because they knew if they had somebody that came forth and sued them and, and spread the word that their, you know, their drugs were dangerous, that nobody would buy from them. And that brand name protection is no longer really part of our drug culture. We don't even think of it when we go to the pharmacist. No, we don't. So, so there's a ways that liberty protects us better than government. Because see what's happened now. We've asked government to protect us. Have the FDA, if the FDA was truly to approve drugs that were only safe and effective, it would approve nothing. 